In this episode, let's make our entities move. We'll add a system to motivate our little cubes with some simple harmonic motion. Then you can control how a wave ripples through them with some custom components. Using ECS, it doesn't take much code at all to generate this type of effect, and you'll see that it's a fun interactive exercise. If you follow the series up until this point, your scene should look like this. We have an X by Y grid of entities forming a small wall of cubes. If you're just joining us or you just want to pick up from here, download the starter project from the link in the description. Otherwise, I encourage you to watch the first couple of videos where we explore how to create entities in ECS. Okay, so that was the E of ECS. Let's talk a little bit more about the C and the S, components and systems. Remember that ECS roughly translates into things, data, and logic. And just a side note, don't confuse ECS components with monobehavior components. They are different things altogether. So far, we've only dealt with data that comes predefined with our packages. For example, in several scripts, we have imported the translation and rotation ECS components from the using Unity transforms line. You can locate the Unity transforms resources in the packages. If you find the definition of the translation component, for example, and open it up in the compiler, you'll see that's very simple. There's a namespace and some attributes, but really a component is just a struct that implements I component data. The interface I component data basically limits what type of data our component can contain. And those are limited to the following, what C sharp calls bootable types, bytes, ints, or floating point values, Unity also allows you to specify a bool or a car as valid data types. And there are a few other things that we won't talk about just yet. As a general rule, expect to see value type fields in your components. Reference types are not permitted. You won't see a field that points to another object, for example. By using these simpler data types with fixed sizes, dots can pack the data more tightly in the memory and tighter packing equals better performance. As we've already seen, the translation component contains a single field called value that is a float three. We use that to position our cubes earlier, either with a script or with the convert to entity utility handling the conversion. It's typical for components to maintain just a small number of fields in each struct. And if it's a single field, you'll often see it labeled value. In the scripts folder, let's make a couple of subfolders, data, and systems, our scripts are gonna fall in these two categories. Remember that components are data and systems are logic. Let's create our own custom component just so you get the gist of it. And it's not complicated. In the data subfolder, create a new c -sharp script. Let's call this file move speed data. Edit the script, and then add a using unity.entities line at the top, using unity.entities, and get rid of the other using lines, we won't need them. A component must implement I component data rather than inheriting from mono behavior. And very important, this must always be a struct and not a class. If you forget that, you'll get an error message, but referencing a different script, so the error won't be obvious. So just watch out for that little gotcha. Because this is a struct and no longer a mono behavior, these methods don't apply, so let's just get rid of them. Components hold data only. There's never any logic enclosed inside. One cool thing about ECS is that we don't have the same naming restrictions as with mono behaviors. The struct name does not necessarily need to match the file name. Now, if I were so inclined, I could change my struct name to just move speed, and that's perfectly legal. You may want to name the file slightly differently just for organizational purposes. That's up to you. Inside of the move speed, we're gonna define one field, a single float called value. We aren't allowed to initialize anything here. We'll have to do that in our prefab. So once I define this custom component data, we wanna apply it to our prefab game object, but we're gonna need something extra to do that. And just to demo this, I will disable the spawner temporarily and drag the converted cube prefab into the hierarchy. Go ahead and unpack the prefab completely. If you try to drag the move speed data onto the converted cube object, it really won't work. You should get this error. To fix that, 
in the script, you'll need to add a small attribute to the top of the struct. Generate authoring component, just like that. One little attribute, save this, and then go back to the editor. Try it again, and success. When you drag the move speed data onto the converted cube, it automatically creates a mono behavior called move speed authoring. It has one field called value, which defaults to zero. So go to play mode. In the entity debugger, you should see an extra component data called move speed added to the chunks archetype. It has a value of zero. Now when you exit play mode, let's set the value to something else. I'll arbitrarily switch that to something like say three. Now in play mode, our converted cube entity has a move speed value of three. As we've already seen, the convert to entity utility tries to process certain components and convert them into their entity equivalents. Things like translation, rotation, certain rendering components, for example. If you add a mono behavior authoring component, that gets converted as well. In this case, we've added a move speed to our entity archetype and any values that we have set on the game object gets converted into the entity at runtime. Okay, so we've learned how to add custom data to our entities. Let's save this so we can have access to it later. I'm going to save the game object right over the existing converted cube prefab and replace it. And that way our entity prefab will get the custom move speed component data every time we instantiate an entity. Okay, so we have some entities and some custom component data. Let's make the cubes move with a system. Systems comprise the logic of ECS. Remember, things, data, logic. Think of systems as equivalent to the methods of a model behavior. If you want to perform some action on your entities, you need a system. Create a new C -sharp script in the systems subfolder. And let's call this wave system. We're going to be moving our mass of cubes using a sine wave. Inside of the script, get rid of start and update. This is not going to be a mono behavior. Likewise, drop the using lines. Instead, we'll add a using unity entities, using unity transforms, and using unity mathematics. Note that we're going to use a slightly older convention for creating our system. We're going to inherit from component system. Now it still works, but this system only runs on the main thread. So that means that it only uses one CPU core to handle all the calculations. Even if you have the fanciest Core i9 or Ryzen CPU, then too bad. We're only using one CPU thread. Later on, we'll switch this to the job component system or the newer system base. We want to split up our task onto multiple cores, but the component system will just introduce us to the basic syntax, and then we'll add the job system stuff later. Our system shows up in red, meaning there's an error. We can fix that using the compiler with quick fix, implement abstract class, and you'll see that it adds an on update method to our system. We don't want to throw an exception, so let's just clear this line out. The on update method runs every frame, very similar to how the update method of mono behavior works. Systems can also implement methods like on create and on destroy. Again, similar to how we have these built-in events to mono behavior but the only one that we're required to implement is on update. Once we have that, the error is gone and we can compile. Inside of the system, ECS gives us a special function to iterate through all the entities in our scene, and that's entities.foreach. The for each takes a lambda expression as an argument, and a lambda takes the form of this, some set of input parameters in parentheses, followed by a equals plus a greater than symbol, and that goes to some expression in curly braces. We can reference any of a given entity's components using the ref keyword. So let's say you wanted to change the entity's translation. You would add an input parameter, ref translation, and let's call that trans for short. The ref keyword means that we're passing in the parameter by reference. That allows us to change each parameter value while we're inside of this expression. And within the curly braces, we need to add some logic. And usually I will format the Lambda expression like this with the curly braces on their own lines, because you could have several statements inside of here. 
Now, in our case, we'll do something super simple like change the Z position of each cube to flow along with a wave. So we'll set up a float called Z position and then set that equal to math.sign. Unity Mathematics gives us this function. Again, we can't use anything from mono behavior. We have to use something special that Unity has written for dots. And inside of here, we want to pass in the total elapsed time. And you can find that under time dot elapsed time. Again, we don't have access to the time class for mono behavior. Instead, we have to use the time dot elapsed time from ECS. Time dot elapsed time is a double, so we will need to cast this as a float. That's why it's in red. And now we have a simple sine wave stored in a Z position variable. We want each cube to stay in its respective X and Y position, but move along the Z axis. To do that, just set the trans value equal to a new float three with the X equal to the existing X value. So that's trans value X and the Y also stays the same. So that's trans value Y and the Z gets the Z position that we just defined. And okay, there's our entities for each and that lets us loop through every entity in the scene. We pass in this special Lambda expression that takes components as the input parameters, follow that with the Lambda operator and put the body expression within the curly braces. And that's the basic structure of a system. When we make it multi-threaded, it looks a little bit different, but get used to this entities for each and Lambda expression first. Once you save the script, then that's it. It's live. Unlike a mono behavior, there's no need to drag a system onto anything in the game scene. If it compiles, this logic runs on every entity that has a translation component. In our case, that's every entity in the scene. Whether you want it or not, this system is now active and it will execute the instant we enter play mode. Back in the editor, let's re-enable the spawner object. No need for this converted cube in the hierarchy since we've saved that as the prefab. In play mode, now we have our wall of cubes, but now it gently rocks back and forth. Essentially, with two lines of logic, we've added some motion. Now let's see how we can control this with some extra data. Our entity prefab has a custom component called move speed that we added earlier. Let's use that to modify the speed of our cubes. In the input parameters of the lambda, let's add a ref move speed, and let's call that camel case move speed as well. In the body of the lambda, we can speed up the motion simply by multiplying the elapsed time by move speed dot value. Again, this for each will run for every entity in the scene that has both a translation and a move speed component. It's active the instant that I save the file and it compiles. Then when we go back to Unity, we see that our motion has been sped up accordingly. The move speed value is currently stored in the converted cube prefab. If you locate that and change the value, the cubes should change speed accordingly. If you up this to 10, for example, in play mode, the oscillation happens much faster. And probably move speed is a bit of a misnomer since we're dealing with waves, but you get the idea. Now, speaking about waves, if you recall the formula for a basic sine function, you will remember that we can tweak the motion using these parts of the formula. We can vary the amplitude, the angular frequency, and the phase shift. We're currently adjusting the angular frequency using the move speed dot value. We might want to add some other data to control the size and offset of the wave as well. Let's define another component, wave data, to modify our wave motion and create a new c -sharp script called wave data. Edit the script and replace the using lines with using unity.entities. This needs to be a struct, not a class. So let's make that a struct. And we'll keep the name wave data. And instead of mono behavior, we will implement i component data. This is a struct, it doesn't have any methods or logic, so these need to clear out. And let's just define three public float fields. Public float, amplitude, public float, and I'll call this x offset, 
and public float y offset. And of course, we'll need to add a generate authoring component attribute at the top. Save this file. In the editor, drag the wave data component onto the converted cube prefab. You should see a wave data authoring mono behavior appear. And we can set up some decent starting values. I'll go with a 5 for the amplitude and maybe 0 0.25 for the x and y offset. Just try something relatively small. In the wave system, add the wave data to the input parameters of the lambda expression. Ref wave data, and we'll call that wave data. Now that our wave data is in the input parameters, we can use the wave data dot amplitude and multiply that by the sine function. Okay, let's see the result of that. Save the system and let's go back to Unity. In play mode, the whole wall of cubes now displaces much more in the z direction. Before, it was bouncing between z equals negative 1 and z equals 1. Now it moves between z equals negative 5 and z equals 5. You can adjust the amplitude on the prefab to dial that distance up or down. Of course, the motion is a bit dull right now. We can't really see the wave effect because each cube moves exactly the same amount in z as its neighbor. Let's add a small phase shift based on each cube's x and y position. We'll use those x and y offsets that we created earlier in the wave data. So we can do something like this. Add a translation value x multiplied by the wave data x offset. And then we'll also add a translation value y multiplied by the wave data y offset. And now a ripple motion will be more apparent since each neighbor will hit a slightly different part of the sine wave. All right, let's save this and try it out. And look at that. It now flutters like a flag in the wind. That's pretty neat for something that is so relatively simple. Of course, you can vary several things to change how it moves. On the converted cube prefab, adjust the move speed and the wave data to achieve different wave-like motions. You can easily make it more subtle or more frenetic. Take a look at some of these sample settings and then experiment on your own. And don't forget, you can always go back to the spawner and change the dimensions of the cube array. The more cubes you have in here, the more resolution you have to work with. And remember, you can resize the gap in between each cube with the spacing. And now you have a neat effect that was built with just a tiny bit of math. Okay, great. We've now learned how to apply very simple logic to move our cubes, and we've touched on all three parts of ECS. Of course, we need to do a lot more to turn this into some kind of gameplay, but this should give you a good foundation to start exploring dots. Next time, we'll look more at the job system and burst compiler to see how we can speed up and optimize our simulation. Then you can have literally thousands, or maybe tens of thousands, entities on screen. Well, that's all I have for this episode. If you want to see more content like this, you can support the channel by subscribing to our premium courses. Just go to gameacademy.school, build a neat little piece for your portfolio, or just brush up on your game dev skills. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Until next time, this is Wilmer. I'll be seeing you in the Game Academy.